The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, MLC Limited, ABN 90 000 402, AFSL 230694, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Ryan Watson, CEO of Trebeca Financial, Australia's leading financial wellbeing advice firm. You're listening to a podcast series dedicated to exploring and understanding all things wellbeing through a financial advice lens. This is a special four-part mini-series from the Ensemble podcast. Over four episodes, we will talk with practitioners and wellbeing experts to understand financial wellbeing, what are its foundations, how can it be used in a personal sense, as well as taught as a practice to clients. Vivo is the award-winning health, wellness and recovery service from MLC Life Insurance. It supports people at every stage of life's journey, in sickness and in health. Vivo is available at no additional cost to MLC Life Insurance customers. And because we know advisors are the backbone of our industry, MLC Life Insurance offers some Vivo services for free to our partner advisors and their staff. To find out more, contact your distribution representative today. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Tristan, for joining us today. Uh, Where are we coming from? Harry, yourself? I'm over in Singapore. I've been here for about six weeks now with another two weeks to go. Okay, nice. Um, And for those, obviously, I'm in Melbourne, so it's nice and cold. Tell us how warm and and humid it is where you are, Harry. Uh, you might see me throughout this conversation just wiping the sweat off my forehead. It's about twenty eight. It's I think the high average highs are around thirty thirty one. Average lows okay. around twenty seven twenty eight. Humidity is I know one hundred and sixty nine percent. No, I'm kidding. It's like seventy five eighty percent. Nice and warm. And uh, what about yourself, Tristan? Where about yeah, you, I, mate? I went right past Singapore. We're in Germany at the moment for the uh, yeah. Australian winter. Um, for three months in a little town called Halle in uh, eastern Germany. Yeah, and if you don't mind me asking, what specifically took you there? We come here every year we can. Um, we try and do three months here and then nine months back in Sydney. My wife's got family mm-hmm. over here, so we're staying okay. in the same um, region as my daughter's cousins and their besties, and they get along so well, and um, my wife's sister and their family. And we're helping okay. my parents-in-law migrate from the other side of Germany to this town so that everyone's going to be in the same place over here. Um, wow. So we've done a little bit of that moving already, and uh, it's going really well. Great, fantastic. Well, a different, uh, a little bit different, a little bit more interesting today in terms of where you guys are coming from as compared to myself here in Australia. So we might kick it off. You know, I'm. I said to Harry when we were talking earlier, I'm really interested and intrigued, excited about today's conversation because when we did a bit of a preamble across the 15 minutes, Tristan, you warned me that we could go to any and all places, and there's excitement around that. So. Today, yeah. I want to see, you know, obviously I've got a structure and a strategy, but I really want to also see where we end up in today's conversation. So it's always a good place to start. I've done my research. You know, what we're looking today is what role does well-being, but also this mindfulness piece um, and the mental health component play for clients of yours and how do you draw on that? So if we can start at the start with you guys, um, what's your journey been like to this point in terms of building your practice? And how have you got to where you are? Yeah, I'll just start. you start that one for the the second half. So I'd been advising for about four and a half years when I started the business. Because I advised in 2018, um, I always wanted to do coaching mm-hmm. and advice together. And having been at the AMP Horizons Career Changer Program, which I know many listeners will be at least familiar with, and it was a great program at the time, and they really facilitated exploration of how advice could be done. Um, I was given the kind of the tools and the space to go through the entire advice process from prospecting a very cold set of AMP leads, um, a, a sheet of 200 names, um, right through to every aspect of the SOA um, production and all the implementation. You do it all yourself. There's obviously support and resources, but you're forced to do everything. And I, I enjoyed it, um, but it got me thinking about every element of the process in detail, um, as, as you would when you're forced to do it. And it struck me up, up front that um, this advice process needs to have coaching as it's like its sidekick as its brother and i shared that with a lot of the people in the community and the leadership and there was minor resonance and a lot of pushback 
most people said it can't be done. It's not realistic. It's not profitable, especially not working with 20 and 30 year olds. <laughs> You're just not going to make enough money. And to be honest, people weren't wrong. It's very hard work to bring well-being coaching to younger people who don't have the assets just yet and run it within the situation of a financial advice business with quite high cost margins and high compliance burden. Um, but I was committed, still am to this day, and I'm a believer that it can be done if it's done smart. So I kicked off five, five and a half years ago and very early in knew I needed a partner. Couldn't do this by myself. And uh, that's when I reached out on what was XY Advisor at the time and um, connected with Harry amongst a few others. Um, and Harry, you joined towards the end of that year. Um, and that was, I guess, how things started to evolve beyond just my own skill set and I- experience into something something larger. Fantastic. And obviously a good segue, Harry, in terms of you joining the podcast. Yeah, so from my side, I was... Uh, I finished uni. I, when I went to uni, I decided I don't know what I'm going to do. Something around finance, something about money, and something about helping people will just kind of make sense. And ended up going pursuing financial advice. And I went down went down the path of trying to become a financial advisor. With and I I started off in a small firm. It wasn't quite the right fit um, for for various reasons, which I'm sure many uh, many of the listeners who have been in smaller boutique firms can understand if there's just not quite the right cultural fit. Uh, and I ended up deciding to go into the main companies instead, which are doing it. So to go to the product side before getting back towards advice, just to understand another perspective, because it seemed like everything around advice was just from a product perspective. So let me understand that. And so I was in BT, uh, in Asgard first, and then got involved in a whole bunch of different projects which are there, and then managed to work my way across into Westpac Premium as an advisor assistant. And then I was around 26 when I, was, when I became a financial advisor, uh, working with high net worth clients, Westpac Premium, which was amazing. It was a, it was a very privileged time, a, very, a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to work with people who are typically much older than I was. Uh, but especially to be able to learn from my mentor at the time, who had some somewhat similar frustrations around the corporate environment in terms of how he was actually able to help clients in the way that he wanted to, and eventually chose to leave and we we left together. But throughout that time, I started a personal development journey. My wife had a really challenging role, let's just say, and without going into the details of it, I'm like, well, I know all the answers. You've got to listen to me. And... She wasn't listening. I'm like, well, then you've got to go to someone else because you're just not listening to me. I was, I was very obnoxious and quite arrogant at the time, let's say. And she ended up, I ended up saying, well, how about this Tony Robbins event? She's like, I'm not going to go to it alone. I said, fine, I'll come along with you, but I'm not going to get anything out of it. I'm just going because I'm a loving husband. That's the reason why. And that, that event actually changed my life, uh, transformed yeah. it entirely. Yeah. Uh, I had a belief set of you live and you die, so what's the point? To life short, make the most of it. And when I changed that, I recognized I've actually got to find ways to make the most of life. And so I started making all these changes uh, within my own life. And then as a result of it, I had family and friends and colleagues and even clients start saying, well, Harry, you're, you're different from the last time I saw you. You're happier, you're healthier, you've got more energy, you're more excited, you're more passionate, you're more focused, you, you know what you're doing. Like, what are you doing differently? Can you, can you help me? I want to do the same thing. And then I was able to say, well, great. I mean, this worked for me, maybe it'll work for you. Or this I tried, but didn't work for me, but maybe it'll work for you. And a lot of my conversations with people became very naturally coaching conversations. And that was with the people who wanted to change. And then I started learning coaching because I realized that other people don't necessarily want to change, but you can inspire them to want to. And a lot of my client conversations became less about money and more about life and goals and aspirations and then mindset and perspective and purpose. And as a result of that, I had, I had this burning desire to do work, not, not, not just the financial work with clients. I love the impact that financial advice makes on clients' lives. It's, it's incredible. You're, you're literally able to give them a sense of certainty by helping them change the, what they're doing with their money, where they're putting it, how they're investing it, having insurance, all these different things that you're able to do with a client that really enhances their life and their experience. But there's more to it. And when I, I think I joined, uh, so I went into business with my previous mentor uh, or my mentor at the time is my previous business partner and went to one of the Securator events. It was the first time outside of Westpac. And uh, one of the other advisors was like, oh, did you check out XY? You're like, you're young enough to kind of get involved in that group. Go check them out. 
And I did. And it was a Facebook group. And Tristan was like, hey, I've, I'm looking for a business partner. I, I do coaching and advice. And I'm like, hey, I'm really happy where I am. I'm not looking for anything new. But what you're saying sounds amazing. Let's just have a chat. And so uh, those conversations became a friendship and eventually became a, a business partnership as well. I joined in with what Tristan had started. Well, the, premise, the premise of all of that, um, and I'll let Tristan expand more on what the development has been, but the premise of that was that there's not much point in having a financial plan unless you have a life plan first. Your financial plan is one of those segments within your life that's really important to have a plan, have a strategy for, move, move towards something that's really valuable and that you really want in your life. And it's, it's kind of like one of those, it's the fuel that allows you to be doing all of the other things that you want to in life. But there are all of these other elements which are really important too. And if you have, if you have that, that amazing car that's driving you where you want to be, sorry about all the analogies, if you have that car that's driving you where you want to be, then you've got to know where the destination is. You've got to know what your milestones are and you've got to know why you actually want to go in that destination and go in that direction. Yeah, makes, makes, perfect, makes perfect sense. And yeah, thank you, for the, uh, thank you for the context. So I imagine, Tristan, you put that call out, which is what we now call Ensemble, and you had Harry reply. Let me let me in on those conversations. I imagine it was like from the start, there was probably sparks going off in terms of you being in each other's heads, understanding what we're saying. Tell me a bit about that journey and how you built a, a trusted relationship and in terms of what the business is now. Yeah, great question, Ryan. Um, well, Harry wasn't the only one that reached out. There was actually a few others, uh, really quality old guys, um, who some of which I've, I've kept good friendships with. And there was another dude um, who was like pole position. He was the most engaged with wanting to start in the business. He he needed an exit from his employment situation. He was getting bored um, and itchy and he had big dreams. And Harry was a bit like, oh, yeah, look, I don't need to move, but let's catch up. So it was a very different tone to what both Harry and I expected. We just met up at Hyde Park near the city. We were, we were reasonably close to each other at the time geographically. Um, and we went for runs together. So very show social. Harry likes to test his friends. Um, so he'd push me to see if I was coachable and like try and get me to push beyond my limits. And I was amicable enough to roll with it. <laughs> um, and then we, we'd finish our run and we'd sit and just talk philosophy and theology for like three or four hours and leave our wives at home wondering where's lunch on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday or something. Um, and we did that a few times. And Harry was going through a lot of personal growth um, with meditation and with grieving were two big things that he, he was processing with me. And there were things that I'd not had a lot of experience with so much myself. So I was super curious and wanting to understand his worldview. I came from a, uh, a Protestant Christian background. Harry came from a... a not so practicing, somewhat anti-religious Jewish with a Buddhist influence experience. And so we both had a lot of, uh, I say compatible, but um, somewhat differentiated perspectives of spirituality and a common deep interest in it. So a lot of our conversations were about understanding the world and how we exist as people and our personal growth journeys. And importantly, our wives' uh personal growth and how we can support them um, and we found a lot of commonality in the role we play in our relationships and within four or five months this other gentleman i was chatting with and a few of the others um it became apparent just weren't ready um had a few things that were not in place and in the meantime harry and i were just getting along better than most of our close connections in our personal life and we were just like look we, we got to make this work and to be honest ryan um from my experience i'm always always wary about partnering with someone that didn't share the same faith um so that was a big decision for me to work through like i know there's a lot of common values here but a, a couple of the things i value a lot harry was highly resistant to anything associated with my faith um he wasn't against he was just highly resistant to and i went to a lot of my mentors at the time to, to workshop that um and it grew me a lot as well i think it was part of my personal deconstruction of faith i'm still a christian to this day but I've come from being probably a very um, narrow-minded understanding of how things have to be in a black and white sense. Um, and Harry's one of Harry's many gifts to me in my life has been learning to open that up and to allow to learn to accept and ultimately to love things that are different to what I would expect or what I would want. And in that acceptance, and I would say love, comes not just great understanding, um, but comes great strength. 
Um, it challenges and humbles me, but it, it strengthened me a lot. And I have a, a much deeper and richer faith experience today because of the relationship I've allowed with Harry, more so the great work we've been able to do together and how we've learned from one another. Um, and so that was about four months, I guess, four or five months of, we call it courting. And then we got engaged and we, we drew up this engagement contract. And we even drew up the full memory marriage contract for the end of the engagement. I think we did 10 or 12 months of engagement. Um, and then, yeah. And then at the end of that, we, we helped, had a, a, a lawyer made of ours, really lovely girl called Ali, sit down with us and drew up the proper, I think we did the first few contracts all ourselves and then we got a solicitor to do the shareholder agreement. Um, and there was a lot of uh, mentoring input from, from all my mentors and same with Harry. So we both definitely lent on people that we value and respect. So it wasn't just these two kids in their late 20s trying to pretend like they know what's going on. I think we had the right guidance. Um, and I think it set a really solid foundation. Yeah, fantastic. And, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. And what, what I'm hearing from you two, pretty deep on your own journey, found each other, saw how it could work together. I'm really interested to hear now, you know, from you, Harry, about how this translates into your client work. So you're obviously practicing what you preach. So without it being a cliche, can you take us on a bit of the client journey? How does a relationship start with your your clients? What are some structures and some tools that you use? Yeah, look, it's changed a lot throughout throughout the years. Uh, I mean, the basis of it, the principles of it, stay the same, right? Like you understand what you actually want from your life, your purpose, purpose advisory, right? Your purpose, your mission, what are you trying to achieve? And then how can you use your resources available, including your finances, especially finances, to be able to help you achieve that? And then everything that we do kind of lead, like bleeds into how do we support that journey of the client? Now, a lot of, a lot of people come to us mostly by client referrals or business partner referrals. We've got some amazing mortgage brokers and accountants and uh, solicitors who love what we do and send clients our way. And we have a lot of clients who refer their clients to us as well. Uh, and then we have people who reach out to us on Google. We're in a, we've got a office, a formal office in Alexandria in Sydney. And so for the, for those who aren't aware the the twenties to thirties who are trying to buy their first home and will live close to the city, that's, that's the exact place that they're in when they're searching for a financial advisor. To give you an idea, we, we usually have a 20, 30, sometimes ends up being 40, 50 minute first conversation with someone who reaches out to us. And we're just trying to understand what goes on in their life and in their world. And one of our favorite questions to ask is if you could change anything about your life, anything at all, you could change anything about your life right now, what would it be and why? And the answers are not, I want to be confident in my investment strategy. Sometimes it is. But most of the time, it's not just saying, I want to have more money and retire by 65, or I want to get a suite of insurance cover, unless they're specifically looking for that. Usually, it's, I want to have more confidence in my life, or I want to be able to get a promotion, or I want to have a better connection with my spouse, uh, or I want, to be, I want to be less grumpy as a dad and just be more connected with my kids. Like Those are the types of things that people will often start saying. So you had a question there. Did you want to jump in? Yeah, and no, I was going to say it's that's a really interesting one in terms of obviously what you, what I'm hearing here. Like, there's a lot more on the qualitative side. So you obviously you've built trust with those prospective clients. They've come from a trusted source. That one about people want to be less grumpy. Really interesting in terms of what's what's truly important to people, right? Well, I I just wanted to contextualize that because Ryan, part of your question maybe is why are these clients even sharing that? coming to see a financial advisor what gives them the expectation that they're able to share it and to be honest clients don't start the conversation typically yeah. expecting to share these things and um i guess that there is um a method to to our approach that um, enables those things to be shared within the first 30 minutes which i don't think a lot of advisors get the, the chance for <clears throat> i know a lot of advisors appreciate these conversations when they come up even if they don't feel as equipped or even as focused on trying to solve them but firstly, we're intentional about it. If people look on our website, they read our brand, they'll know that's at least part of the gamut of what we're offering. That said, 90 plus percent of the people come to us are very clearly wanting a financial outcome. And they're expecting a financial oriented service with, with maybe a bit of fluff around the edges, right? And they appreciate it. So, so you're right, Ryan, in that there's some pre-screening. Less than half have a warm referral. So the other 50% plus don't have any pre-built trust with us. Um, so we're having to do this right. off, the, off the basis of zero, right, off a website. And um, the the singular technique that we use, and it's more of a principle than a technique, but 
Uh, it's best defined by a couple called Helen and Herville. Um, they've developed the Imago process. Um, it's a really simple mirroring technique where I think you've been doing a bit this meeting, Ryan. You know, Harry will share something. You say, okay, what I've heard you say is this and this and this. And um, the intent with the Imago process is not to try and summarize, nor to jump to conclusions. In fact, the, the essence of it is to repeat back in their explicit words what they said and to be the student and let them be the master and go, did I get that right? Am I hearing you? Um, and you want to do that at least twice in integral, in my experience, ideally three. If you can do three series of that, um, what tends to happen is, this is my analogy in my mind, um, people come in as like this iceberg and they give you no more than 10% of what really matters to them. Um, because since childhood, and this applies to my kids as much as everyone else, no kid really feels hurt. They've got so much stuff they want to say, they don't know how to express it, and no one really gets them, let alone people actually hear their explicit words. Us adults know what our kids are talking about or we know what other people are talking about so we go oh you mean this don't you and they didn't but we think they did and then we keep running as if they did so the first of our lives we're always expecting that no one's going to really hear us no one really cares about us and those few experiences where someone genuinely listens to what you say and repeats back word for word what you say i guarantee it changes the way that person feels and responds instinctively like immediately and what happens is that first 10 percent becomes 30% and then that 30% becomes about 70% and you end up getting to like deep below the water level what really matters to someone. You're looking for their story, you're looking ultimately for their emotions and you're looking for their core value and my challenge to any advisor is to get skilled at getting to someone's core values within 30 minutes and focusing zero on strategy or on anything numerical. Every now and then a client is so biased towards wanting to get your technical input on something and my view there is great someone comes with a really pressing problem solve the problem park it and then get to values um, and if you can in, incorporate that principle into all aspects of your interactions but importantly the very first part because that sets the tone for, for the whole relationship with the business um, you end up with a client that ultimately trusts us they, they'll, they'll trust harry in the intro call but they'll also trust the brand they represent and more importantly they'll start to share what they actually want and if we can then deliver services that genuinely help them not just sell them into something that we want we want to make money off um that's the second half of the equation obviously and that's where you can find a client for life in my experience yeah the the follow the follow through from from asking that question like for example so so hearing what they're saying and then feeding it back to them and getting their insights and then uh, uncovering what tristan's talking about the the lower part of the iceberg the really the really potent part of that is that then you start to understand what do they really want and then you can start to link that with the outcomes that they want to achieve and then off the back of those outcomes we can then link that we can then link that to the services that we're able to help them uh, achieve them and so mm. we're not selling our services we're selling our ability to deliver them to deliver on the outcomes that they want to achieve themselves which you can't do unless you do a deep exploration the very first time you meet them yeah. And so further to that, Harry, am I right in saying you can't do it as an advisor or you can't deliver this type of service if you haven't done the work yourself? Uh, I think that's a very that's a very broad statement and I'm not sure it's entirely accurate. I, I think that it would be it'd be more accurate to say that you'll be much more effective at doing yeah. this type of work if you've done the work on yourself first. And I think there are a lot of amazing financial advisors out there who haven't done as much personal development. Uh, but the ones who I've met, who I really look up to, uh, are the ones who have done a lot of personal development themselves. And then they allow it naturally to come into the conversation. And they jump on the opportunity when it's there, even though they don't feel they've got the skill set, but they, they feel like they're capable of like having the conversation because they've been in a similar type of situation or circumstance. And they'll kind of bleed it in. And they're talking from their personal experience, right? They become a mentor. But to create the service around helping someone shift their beliefs or change their mindset, then, yeah, you're going to be much more effective if you have shifted your own beliefs and changed your own mindset first in order to be able to have that conversation. Yeah. Your, your thoughts, Tristan? Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. I think just like in sales, if you are good at learning a script and you follow them to the letter, you'll probably become best in your sales pod. But if you want to be best in the nation, you've got to deeply believe in what the, the product you're selling, right? And the equivalent for an advisor is is pretty much your question, Ryan. Like, can you can you do great advice work as a coach if you haven't done the work yourself? 
I think you can, for example, learn the Imago technique and rabbit back what you've heard from someone, and I guarantee you'll get a better outcome if you just do that. It feels mechanical, it feels weird, but you get better results, trust me. At least give it a crack. Try it with your wife or with your husband. And that, that's where you really start to see fruit. But yeah. if, if you have a technique which works for 70% of the cases, and then you come across one of those curveballs, um, you're going to need intuition and you're going to need pivot. And that's where having sensitivity and knowing the space yourself, A, is going to give you the confidence to go there, whereas most people wouldn't, and B, is going to get you through. So a, a really extreme example is um, in our uh, life coaching department of our business, uh, we work with pretty much any range of people. If someone's willing to work with us, we'll say yes. Um, we have limitations of how far we'll take a conversation and if situation isn't right for a client, maybe they're bringing up significant trauma and sexual abuse, um, they have existing, you know, doctor defined diagnoses. Um, we will still work with them, but we'll just put some limitations around them. But for example, working with someone who has bipolar and might have had a, a sexual abuse experience early in their life, the person who's running the script won't have the confidence to go through that work, sort of work. There's, there's no way someone will be foolish enough to, to dive into that minefield unless they've been there themselves. Either they've had the same experience and worked through it, or they've worked through it with others and emoted through those spaces and they know how to navigate that world and what you'll learn is the the typical technique of you know going back to unpack some of the trauma um, has to be done from certain angles for example one of the main angles you might take them is like a, a bird's eye view of what the experience was like now for someone who's dealt with a loss or grief that's a really helpful way to get context for what they've lost for someone who's experienced sexual trauma that's probably the quickest way to re-traumatize someone and until you've had that experience working with someone and you brought up their trauma and you've seen it all fall apart, you're not going to know that it, it, your process breaks there. Um, and obviously, these are not light topics. These are really important things. And as an advisor, you're, you don't, you've gone well beyond fiduciary responsibility here. Now, I think there's, there's more like a paternal responsibility um, or, or maternal responsibility to really steward their emotion and steward the space for them. And if you haven't done the work, that there's no chance you're going to get a good outcome for your client. Yeah, and I, I like what you said there too. And the reason why I brought up that point, Harry, around the benefits of having done the work is, I think you raised it, Tristan, it helped get you through the work. So there was confidence mentioned there as well, but you know, the bravery and the willingness to persist in the work, even when it gets really hard. You know, Other disciplines around coaching or advice, what I've seen is that if people haven't, then not that they stumble at the first hurdle, but there are challenges when they're really in the body of work and it get, gets really hard. The, the people who are listening to this are advisors mostly, right? Uh, and I mean, it just depends on what your mandate is as an advisor for your business. What are you actually trying to achieve? If, if, you're, if your website says and if you say to clients that you help them achieve their best life, that you, you help them feel at peace and at ease and that their, their life is so much better as a, as a result of engaging with you, then you've got to be willing to go into these areas that really influence the quality of your life. I mean, if your website yeah. is just saying, I help you get better returns on your investments and have peace of mind that if anything happens to you, that your family's financially going to be okay. Well, that that's great. That's fine. But if it's like, how do you live your best life? Like, how do you live an incredible life? How do you, like, I'm helping, like, if you're, if you're selling dreams to clients, then you can't just talk about money. You can't just talk about finances. You got to start to explore everything that really matters to them. And then you need to have the skills and the capacity and the capability to be able to do it. And it's a great segue, Harry and Tristan, because I did want to delve into some of your client success stories. Like if I, I would, I'd like to pick one each, one, one client from each of you. So I ask, if someone, who comes to the front of your mind in terms of someone that you've helped take them on their journey? What were their goals, obviously, beyond the advice component? Um, and how have, they, how have they been successful? So what if we started with you, Harry? But actually, there was an example which I was going to share early on, talking about right at the intro call, right right before even getting to a discovery meeting. And this guy shows up in the call. He's, he heard Tristan on a podcast, on some property podcast, um, which was, uh, it, he's kind of like, look, I, you just, you guys sound like you know what you're doing and I kind of want some help. I'm like, great. Well, what do you want to achieve? Like, what are you working towards? So, well, I want to get in another investment property. So, Okay. Why do you want to invest in property? This is literally how the conversation went. Uh, why Why do you want another investment property? And he said, "Oh, because I want another stream of income and some more capital growth." I said, "Great. Why do you want another stream of income and more capital growth?" 
And he said, well, isn't that obvious? I said, not to me. You tell me. Why do you want it? I was like, well, that way I'm going to get to a point where I don't have to, where I don't have to work. I said, what's wrong with that? It's like, well, because my work is shitty and I don't like going to work. I said, what's wrong with that? He's like, isn't that wrong for everyone? Like, why are you asking me these questions? I said, it, it could be, it's different reason for me than it is for you. Why is that for you? And he paused and there was a lot of silence and some tears welled up in his eyes as well. He said, well, because it makes me a shitty husband and a cranky dad. I said, and what's wrong with that? He says, that's not how I want to be. That's not how I want to live my life. I said, okay, will getting an investment property help you with being a less cranky dad and a less shitty husband? It's like, no, no, it won't. And this time, at this stage, he had a nice release and he was, he was quite happy. Um, he was able to laugh about it. I said, what will? He said, learning how to be a better version of myself. That's what's going to help me. I just, I just got to get better and less cranky no matter what I'm doing. I said, okay, well, let's work on that. And that basically turned into a coaching conversation. And then that resulted in more coaching conversations about uh, 12 weeks of it. Within the first three sessions, he was already a whole lot better. Uh, he and his family had moved somewhere else, uh, closer to other family where they had some more support and everything was a whole lot better. And then they engaged with us for financial advice and Tristan has been helping him and his wife ever since. I think they do have that investment property now about a year and a half later. Like that's just, that's just one of those examples that come to mind. If you're not willing to go there, then we could have tried to help him get an investment property but all we would have done is gotten him into more debt responsibilities and then had to work even harder in a job that he really doesn't like. And this this might sound like a strange question, Harry, but when you got off that call, how did how did you feel? I, I felt I felt great because that, that conversation uh like by the end of that conversation I'd already helped him with some of the practical tools, especially mindfulness type tools and energy and state management uh type approaches, uh to make changes and i could see the the agony he was in in the beginning of the call and the i wouldn't call it joy at the end of the call but the, um, the excitement for the future the anticipation for what's to come and like a positive anticipation and mm. that that felt great felt meaningful and, and you mentioned there i think within three appointments harry the life change he'd created like i think you mentioned moving closer to family and stuff like that that, so, that, ha that happened later on but within a few yeah. sessions he was no longer a cranky dad or a shitty husband and so like there were some simple things that he was able to do i'll, I'll share it so some some of the audience yeah. might want to hear uh he found himself really not enjoying his work Let, let's just even say imagine that you are enjoying your work but imagine that a lot of stress is built up by the end of your work day and that you've gotten you've gotten back to your home you've You've driven back or you've caught the train, whatever, and you're you're just outside your house and you haven't gone into the driveway yet or you haven't parked on the street just yet and you're about to go in and you know your kids are there and you know your, your spouse is there and you have a forced reminder that reminds you, is this the way that you want to come back into the house? Is this the way that you want to show up for your home and for your family? And you have that reminder, you go, okay, well, no, not right now. This isn't the way that I want to, right? So the first step is becoming much more intentional. And then what can you do to change that? And so for him, he had some, he loves music. And so he was able to find some music that really changed his mood and some, some songs that he really loves. And so this all happened within the first three sessions. He identified a whole bunch of different things that he was able to do between getting out of the car and getting into home. That was the very first step. And then if he was able to change the way that he felt from a two out of 10 to an eight out of 10 before he moved in, went into the house, then even if coming back into the house and all the responsibilities and, and his spouse dumping the kids on him and his like, ah, whatever, like too much, even if that brought him down to a five, well, that's still a whole lot better than if he went in at a two and then stayed at a two or went to a one or got fed up and wanted to leave. And none of this is about diving into past trauma or different experiences or becoming a psychologist or psychotherapist. It's literally just equipping him with the tools to be able to take notes. And then he started applying it to his work as well. So it's no longer just going to work however he is after the mad rush in the morning of fighting traffic and getting his kids to school. It was, how do I want to show up at work right now? And if it was his lunch break, he wouldn't stay in the stay at the office staring at the screen and scoffing down food. He'd make a point to get out of the office, get some nature or get some fresh air. And then again, how does he want to come back to the office again? So for him, it was all about intentionality. Fantastic. Thanks uh, Thanks for sharing, Harry. What about yourself, Tristan? If we're talking, we're thinking about a client success, 
Yeah, of course. I just wanted to add that, I mean, Harry is a skilled coach and he's, um, he's done the work himself. That's really where a lot of it comes from. His personality helps, but he really enjoys engaging with people and he's helped people stop smoking um, more, more than one occasion. He's helped people quit. Um, I mean, th- throughout COVID, there was a lot of people came to us with anxiety, depression, and drinking too much, pretty much. Undiagnosed, just like it all came out in the lockdown. And Harry worked with a lot of these people and he helped a few people just change their habits entirely around drinking, where they experience their food and, and their well-being. Um, he's had a lot of great experiences like that. A lot of the experiences I have um, bias towards the more financial results. I've always played more the, the financial coaching and then the, the advice piece. So I help a lot of people build their own portfolio. Um, I train them to learn fundamental analysis. We teach trading. We help people to get practical solutions a lot of the time. Um, and less often do I focus on the the well being results as my main solution. But one I think really rewarding example comes to mind: um, a lovely gay couple in their late thirties who I had helped four years beforehand when I was employed. Um, I just did a financial advice case for them, and they really appreciated it. It helped them a lot at the time. Um, it was quite simple, and I think we built a rapport. So they came back having looked up me up, realized I was doing more, and they got really excited. They're like, oh, this is going to be even better this time because Tristan's doing his other stuff. And one of the guys in the couple was really simple-minded, didn't want to complicate his life, was very content, but also didn't really enjoy his job. And his partner wanted his his lover to have more joy in his life and to get out of the mold. And so he was really wanting to be like, oh, can you help us? But I kind of want you to help. I won't say his name. And we started the process. One of them was really excited, like a puppy dog. The other was super resistant to the whole process. We get a lot of this where one person in the, the team is more keen than the other. But the other comes along for the ride. And um, we we end up agreeing to take them through our entire process. It's a six-month long coaching process, which has each of the components of the life planning and the personal development, um, and then the cash flow and investments. And to be honest, we barely got to the cash flow because after they'd been through the personal development piece, which of course one of them loved and the other found quite challenging but rewarding, we got to the life vision piece. And I think for a number of reasons, but a lot because of their different approaches to these conversations, they hadn't been able to really explore their shared vision together, not in detail. They knew what they were roughly looking for. They wanted to pay off their home. They wanted to eventually move out of the city and have a more relaxed life. But that's as far as they got. I think that was the level of definition they had. We spent the three to three and a half hours over a number of sessions doing the life plan with them. And one of the key components of the life plan is to get someone to articulate, um, well, a couple, to articulate their 10-year vision in a lot of detail, um, specifics of what the property looks like, what location it is, which kids or animals are there, um, what friends they have come around, their assets, their hobbies, how much they travel, and then we break it down into a, a full day lived out. At first, it's all the bits and pieces. Then it's sort of fleshed together as a narrative, morning to noon to, to afternoon. And um, and they each contribute. So it's a shared vision. It's not yours and yours, um, which takes a bit of practice as a facilitator to help two people come to a collective vision, let alone to help anyone really share their dreams and their desires. Um, and at the end of that, we prompt them to build a, a visual vision board so they hop on Pinterest, they select a whole bunch of images and they create uh, an asset ultimately, which represents their vision. Now, what was surprising is after the, the vision activity, these guys went on hiatus. I didn't hear from them for like three months. They rescheduled twice and then canceled. And I was like, oh, what's going on with these guys? And then I get a call out of the blue from the excited one. And he's like, Tristan, just wanted to let you know, we just settled on our dream property. Um, what they'd done is they'd decided that they actually had the assets they required just to make it work. They had the serviceability for the property. They sold up. They bought in the mountains. Their plan was to do this cool Airbnb thing. So it was their home with a side spot that they would build the B&B. Um, they were, he was calling me whilst he was standing on the deck looking at the beautiful nature with the birds. Like all these specific elements which had come in his vision um, in detail, which they both were now enamored by. Um, his partner was completely unlocked. He decided to retire, early retirement, and just to tinker. And he was going to basically build the B&B. Um, because he wasn't engaged in his work in the first place, 
And so much of his personality was unlocked through that process of refinding his, his role in life. Um, we ended up about five or six months later coming back to finish the process, which was helpful and good. And it, you know, financially, it actually helped them quite a bit. Um, but the work was almost complete there. And all they needed was someone to take them that step further, hold their hand to explore their vision as a team. And they were so motivated. I mean, I think it, it lent a lot on them as a couple. Some couples have the resources and the aptitude to run with a vision. Others need hand-holding every step of the way and a lot of emotional trauma and limitations can get in the way. But it's rewarding to see that sometimes it's just so simple, a little key to unlock someone's future. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing, Tristan. Now, we've got a couple of minutes left. So I just, from each of you, uh, for those advisors who are listening, what's a, what's a key piece of advice you would individually give to them if they want to explore and evolve more into this coaching space? We'll start with you, Harry. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very, it's, uh, it's going to be a, a struggle to make that a short answer. So yeah. I'll, I'll try and make it as concise as possible. Uh, I'd say that there are two elements. Uh, the one is all about personal development, how you grow yourself, understanding your actions and your behaviors, uh, being able to explore, like, what do you want from life? Understand your own values. Learn the emotions that are driving your behaviors. Like start to understand that, become aware of that and take action accordingly. Start to ask yourself, if I could change this, what would it be? If I wanted it another way, what would it be? How do I find the mentors or the resources or the education or the books or the, or the courses that I can possibly engage with in order to become better at who I want to be, right? Accepting that my success or that my, my wealth or that my growth as a person uh, is beyond just how much money I'm able to accumulate or how much income I'm able to earn or how much my clients pay me. And the second element of that, which I know we're limited for time, so I'm going to limit how much I talk about it, but is a sense of mindfulness. Uh, I teach meditation. That's something which we do in Purpose Advisory. Tristan's run through the course as well. Uh, we teach meditation with a guy who was a monk for 10 years, actually. He's got so wow. much wisdom exactly. to share. Okay. He yeah. he left the monastery and wanted to kind of resettle in the US. And he was interested in personality system, which we which we coach clients through as well. And I was curious about meditation and kind of helped each other out and built a really close friendship. And he, he's been joining and teaching meditation to a lot of our clients and just to other people who wanted to learn. And the key reason why a financial advice practice would start teaching meditation as well is that you really can't have an exceptional quality of life if you're not aware of what's actually driving you. If you're not aware of what's going on in your mind in those moments of conflict, but also in those moments of joy, why do you do what you do? And the most important step towards that is to have a sense of awareness and stillness to be able to appreciate why. And then to have the skill set that in a moment where you're feeling really rage, rageful or angry or saddened or, or threatened or fearful, that in that moment, you're able to identify what's there and then allow yourself to let it go. It's a very powerful skill to have. And I, I kind of wish that my personal development uh, journey had started with the part which I've kind of uh, spent most time in in the last couple of years, which is on meditation. I've been practicing meditation for six and a half years, but I'm talking about the the process that we helped Jai share with the world. And that's because if you have that awareness, then all the other things which you want to change along the way and you, which you want to adjust become so much easier to take action and then you're more aligned to it. And even if it starts feeling a lot more confusing or a lot more strange, I guess, uh, as you go through your journey or you don't have the same concrete answers as to what you actually want to do, it becomes clearer and you start to learn to trust your intuition and it makes a very, very big difference. So without talking more about that, that's kind of my attempt at two minutes on sharing. Fantastic. Thanks, Harry. That's really that's really interesting. For yourself, Tristan? Yeah, I'll give as many as I can fit in the two minutes. So first up, look into Imago. Yep. It's powerful. It'll change your life. Um, practice it wherever you can with clients, especially. Um, second would be... Uh, Shameless plug, Lumiant, great tool, um, very solid team. I think they've done the best job at creating software which facilitates well-being conversations. Um, Ryan, if you haven't looked into it, if they're not part of this podcast, I'd encourage you to get included in some way because they're, they're forging the way in terms of someone who wants to do the wellness conversation but doesn't feel they have the skills. This software does about 70 to 80% of the facilitation the structure for you. You can sit in the same sort of meeting you would have otherwise done follow the Lumion process 
and you'll find way more traction and resonance with clients than you've ever had before. So it's cool how tech can help in that regard. There'll be more that will come. Yeah. Fantastic. And I'm sure Santi will be happy with that shout out. Well done, Tristan. Yeah, yep, that's good. good. I like good. it. Thank you. I'm glad. Um, the yeah. other key would be mentoring. Um, if you're wanting to coach someone through something, you've got to be coached through it yourself. There's no point trying to lead someone through something if you haven't been led yourself. Otherwise, how will you know how to do it? As humans, we all learn by templating. We're all we're kids of some sort of caregiver and we copy them shamelessly. For the good and for the bad, we copy the, the role models that we're given. And so you want to seek out the best role models in this regard and you want to get under them and as close to them as possible. Pick up as much as you can of how they interact with you. How do they ask you questions? How do they challenge your thinking? Whatever their quality is to you is going to limit how much you can offer to others. Um, so seek out mentors. If you've not had them naturally before, you have to be intentional. Um, learn how to build mentors around your life and turn the existing caregivers or mentors you have into supercharged mentors who give you the best of what they have to offer. They're probably the, the main keys. Mate, makes makes perfect sense. Can I can I quickly add something to, sure. to what Tristan cool. just shared yeah, about mentors? Yeah. We <laughs> we we have a we have a podcast as well, a purpose advisory called Success with Purpose. Shameless plug. I'm, I'm going to share it now. But the, the reason I'm it. the reason I'm sharing it is because uh, we we have so many of our clients struggle with having the right mentors around them. Like, and at best, we kind of become the sorry. At worst, like at least we kind of end up becoming the mentors for them. At best, they've got some amazing people in their lives, and they're able to find mentors. Uh, or sometimes we're able to even connect some of our clients with some of our own mentors. But it seemed to be that the way that people would engage with mentors the best or so-called mentors is by learning from them at a distance. And the challenge with doing that by listening to people's podcasts or by reading people's books or whatever is that sometimes it doesn't share that much of their journey. It just shares their expertise and their life lessons. And the reason for this podcast, if, if you're hearing this, if you just heard what Tristan said and you want to get mentored more yourself, uh, in terms of being able to become a better advisor or just a better husband or a better wife or a better parent or a better friend or whatever you want to be better at, right? Then find somewhere that you're able to approach new mentors. And if you don't feel confident to approach them and connect with them or you're not sure you can find the right people, then that's part of the reason why Success with Purpose was created. You can learn from people's journeys and they can become mentors from you with me asking them questions specifically on how would you help someone who's listening to this who's struggling with that? How would you help them develop it or become holistically successful the same as you? So that's success with purpose. Thanks, Harry. And thanks, Tristan. Another real value add for, for those people, particularly advisors who are listening today. So um, we'll wrap it up there. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Harry. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Tristan. I uh, understand you know, you're know you at all parts of the world, but Really enjoyed the conversation. Like I said at the start, wasn't sure where it would go, but uh, I learned a lot along the way as well. So thanks for your time, guys. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Great Russ. to be here.